It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, a dear friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Ted Lyon was born in Salt Lake City, graduated from the University of Utah, and then received his Ph.D. at UCLA in 1967. He's taught at UCLA, the University of Oklahoma, the University of Wisconsin, and Glasgow University in Scotland. Currently, he is Professor of Latin American Literature in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at BYU, and also serves as Coordinator for Latin American Studies on the BYU campus. He's published four books and more than 40 articles on Latin American culture, art, and literature. From 1975 to 79, he served as chair of BYU's Latin American Studies Interdisciplinary Program and as associate dean of honors for one year. He's also served as chair of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and later as director of undergraduate studies at the Kennedy Center. He and his wife Cheryl have five children and 15 grandchildren. Uh, they served three years as a mission president in Osorno, Chile, and later accepted a second calling for two years at the MTC, as the MTC president in Santiago. In 2006, the president of Chile named Ted as Chile's honorary counsel for Utah and surrounding states. So our great pleasure now to hear from Dr. Uh, Ted Lyon on migrations, the perplexity of who is being baptized. Professor Lyons. I have all kinds of reasons for feeling fairly intimidated today. Uh, to start off with the fact we're not talking about immigration up here, as it says on there, we're talking about migration, so that's the first error. Uh, we're making it a little broader than, than immigration. In other words, we're going to be talking about emigration and immigration, both aspects of migration. The second reason, I suppose, for being intimidated, it's not easy to follow a university president as eloquent as, as Mike Young. Uh, my goodness, that's, uh, that is intimidating. I would feel much more comfortable, actually, if, if I could talk about the poetry of Pablo Neruda or uh, the short stories of uh, Jose, Jorge Luis Borges. But this paper has perhaps an interesting genesis. <clears throat> Serving at the MPC now as a, here in Provo as a branch president of a, a small branch, a Spanish-speaking branch, I keep receiving missionaries who are going to strange places to learn Spanish. <clears throat> Just a few weeks ago, we had missionaries going to the Spanish-speaking Anchorage, Alaska mission. Uh, <clears throat> a few weeks before that, missionaries going to South and North Dakota to speak Spanish as well. That tells me the same thing that you learn and understand as you go to McDonald's. Maybe you don't, but uh, that was mentioned in last, uh, the last talk. Wherever you go, who's serving your food? <clears throat> Who makes your beds when you go to the hotel? Not at home, that's probably, well, anyway, what I'm talking about when you go to the hotel or, or whatever. Uh, we have immigrants in this country, but what I want to talk about, of course, is much broader than simply immigrants to the United States because we're looking at, at the worldwide church and we're looking at the world in general. When Paul Heyer asked me to prepare a paper for this conference <coughs> dealing with migration, I, of course, had some doubts. I'm not an expert in the area, and so I'm claiming that to begin with. I've done some studies on <clears throat> migration from Latin America to the United States. I've done studies on internal migration within Latin America. But those are the, the few qualifications that I have for reading uh, this or discussing this paper. We are really talking about a broader issue as we're looking about migration and baptisms in the LDS Church. I contacted Cyril at the uh, church office and tried to get information. He was very cooperative and very helpful, but simply informed me that the information that the church keeps on with respect to migration and immigration and baptisms is confidential and proprietary. So there's someone sitting in this audience who knows a heck of a lot more than I do uh, about the topic that I'm talking about and who may uh, <laughs> reveal that confidential and, uh, and uh, proprietary information to the Quorum of the Twelve, but not to me. But in desperation, and trying to get some information, I recalled a book that I read a few years ago by Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity, in which he often makes a comparison of the rise of Christianity in early centuries to the uh, baptisms and increase of the Mormon church in the, uh, the 19th and 20th century. Some of his statistics have certainly proved to be wrong or will prove to be wrong in the future. 
But anyway, he's the man. I wrote to Rodney and uh, I think I got a response. I wrote and gave him a whole bunch of fairly serious questions that I wanted to, to ask, uh, wanted him to tell me about, such as, does he have information on this and that and so on. And I really gave him some detailed things and I had a list of about eight questions and I was hoping that I would get them answered properly. His response was rather short, uh, <laughs> as you can see here. Uh, these are very interesting questions and I just don't know what to say. Uh, good luck, let me know if you find out anything. <laughs> Uh, so there's where we are. Now, what sources have I used? I've used CIA Factbook, several United Nations documents, but some interviews talking with mission presidents, with missionaries, and talking with converts. Now, contrary to what uh, <clears throat> President Young just said a, a few minutes ago, I am going to be somewhat anecdotal toward the end of the thing and not just factual or data-driven, but uh, I do have some, datas that, that some data that work out uh, will show you some of the things we're going to. I would hope, though, that you would draw your own implications from what we're dealing with. I hope that your experience, and so many of you have had this experience, will either confirm or deny the proposition that I'm going to make toward the end of the paper uh, as far as giving some statistics for baptisms in the LDS Church. <clears throat> and if there is time for questions, I think there will be. I hope you'll contribute and help us out. But I view what we're doing as simply a beginning of a study that, that needs to be done much more. And some of the questions I'm going to leave you with are things that will, uh, I believe, <clears throat> uh, allow us as a group to try solving some problems. Let's begin with migration, worldwide migration. By the way, you're not going to see something ahead of you just to, to keep you entertained all the time. I'm really pretty much of an anti-PowerPoint person, uh, and I don't know why I did it this time, but uh, we put together a few facts and a few details that will work. But I hope you'll listen to me, and what takes place here that's important is not so much the number of things you have in your notes and the number of statistics, but in your minds and the things that you'll remember from this and what you make a determination to do as we leave. Let's continue on to the next point. <clears throat> At the present time, there are about six and a half billion people living in the world. Only 3% of these people <clears throat> live outside their country of origin. And that says great, so 97% people, 97 of the world's population is at home. And so we think that's not a very big issue and why do we need to talk about 3%? But let's talk about 3% in numerical status and that is there are about 191 million people who are living outside the country of their birth or the country, uh, their, their native country. 191 million people equals the population of France, Germany, Spain, Austria, Belgium, and Holland. That is, most of what we've called, typically classified as traditional Europe, uh, is the amount of people who are living outside of their country. <clears throat> Some of those people are refugees. About 9.2 million people in the year 2005 are refugees outside their country. That's down, as President Young indicated, from, from previous years. <clears throat> but at least there are people who have moved from their country and the people that we can somewhat trace through legal immigration. I'm not going to go, by the way, this is not the Lou Dobbs show. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go and spend the whole time on illegal immigration and, and the need for that fix, although I uh, think I have some one or two small suggestions for solution. I also want to bring up and mention something that President Young uh, also included, and that is urbanization. At the present, present time, many people are migrants within their own country because they've moved from the rural to the urban areas. And this, this trend that we've been noticing is, is tremendous. Uh, again, from another uh, recent book from a visitor we had here on our campus, Philip Jenkins, uh, I'm sure I've got it someplace, projects to, to the, the year 20, 000, uh, to 2025 and projects that about 62% of the world will be concentra concentrated in larger cities. Tokyo will have about 30 million by then, Bombay and Mumbai about 27.4 million, Lagos, Shanghai, Jakarta, uh, and so on. All of these cities over 20, over 20 million people. Some of them are, are that way now. This also presents for the church a concept of displacement, people who were raised in one area but have moved to another. 
So I continue. <clears throat> I do not want to get involved deeply in illegal immigration other than to say that the statistics we have on it are very, very difficult to handle. The UN, the United Nations statistics only list about four million illegal immigrants around the world. That's woefully uh, underreported. There are many, many more than that. Uh, I suspect in the United States we have about between 10 and 11 million illegal immigrants in this, in this country right now. And that certainly is true of many, many other countries of the world. So to briefly just summar up these, summarize these initial comments on immigration, I say it's happening. We must accept it and use it. It is not to be feared. And I'm talking about migration, immigration in general, and not just illegal. <clears throat> Often migration, as I found in my reading, is rather temporary or circular. People who migrate to one, con one country are not permanently residing in that country. For the first time in, in, in the history of the world as we know it, women now make up almost just exactly 50% of immigrants worldwide. That's, that's a new thing. Women did not used to travel as much now, but now women are moving and going to new countries. In some countries of the world, some of the uh, poorer countries, women make up uh, 70 to 80 percent of the migrants. I don't say, shouldn't say in poorer countries, but leaving poorer countries, 70 per, to 80 percent of the immigrants are women as well. In, excuse me, migration is increasing. People have mobility. It's going to simply going to happen. This also is one of, the reason, one of the ways in which religion is spread, as I'll show in, in just a minute. Do you know that there are more Christians in China than there are in France? Would you question that statistic? You wanted data, here it comes, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I take this again from Philip Jenkins' uh, book on the, the next Christendom, showing that, that there are actually more Christians in France, about, about 45 to 50 million Christians in China, uh, and that's a slightly higher the number than there, there are in France. Uh, some of these have come about, a large number of people who left China, were converted to Christianity, and then returned to China. <clears throat> Migrants are aiding development around the world, and that's important to, to me very much. Uh, we know from world banking systems that just last year, two thousand, excuse me, a year and a half ago, 2005, $45 billion were sent from immigrants to the United States to Latin America through legal system, through the legal banking system. Worldwide, $150 billion is being returned to the country of origin. That's, again, through the legal system. We're pretty sure that the, the illegal other ways of, of doing it, at least not, not formal ways, would amount to another 150 billion. So probably $300 billion are going from the country of origin, and not just the United States, but many others, to home. I just returned from Mexico on, on a Friday night or Saturday and um, was amazed at the little villages that we work in to see people building brick homes up to this point, they're basically building rock out of the native rock homes, but now they're building brick homes. There's also a strong absence of men in the villages. The men are in the United States and sending back money. Remittance is the term we use for this money that's coming. So migration is helping development, perhaps helping develop more, development more than many, many government programs. So who's moving around? Who's migrating? Let's just take a look and see what some statistics can show us, and then we'll go on. <clears throat> There is an organization called OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It is made up of some 30 countries, and you can see the 30 countries listed there on the left-hand side, but you will notice that only three of them are in the Western Hemisphere, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. These are the, the countries that have considered themselves, if you will, the developed, more developed countries of the world and the ones that, if you will, absorb immigrants in, into their country, more immigrants into their countries, because people come for economic reasons, of course. Uh, there are many less well-developed countries, and I'm not even going to go deeply into these statistics, but you can see that all of these other countries are receiving uh, immigrants. Here, 1990 to 2000, uh, and so on. We're looking here at the, the percent of change, and then the foreign-born, uh, share of the working population that comes here. 
Now, obviously, you're not going to write down all those statistics, and I will remember them, but if things are published from this uh, uh, activity or from this uh, speech, you'll hear those. We come down to the United States, and indeed, <clears throat> from this period of time, the United States is by far the largest of, of any country in the world at receiving uh, immigrants coming into this country. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> I think we have another chart that we can show you as well. And here is now the region of origin of foreign-born population, where they're coming from and where they uh, may have gone to. Here, oops, whoops, 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 I'm that way too far here. See if we can get back here. Uh, Again, here we have people, the, the standard 30 countries that form, a, form the OECD, and then the areas from which they've, they've come. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, they come from the countries that, the, that maybe original power had had, where it had some colonial influence. Uh, people coming to Portugal may come from Brazil or from, uh, from Latin America, typically in that area. This is sufficient as far as showing stats, but I'm simply wanting to be aware of this organization of economic cooperation and development. Let's ask ourselves, why do people move around? Why don't we just stay home and, and fish on the Provo River, as I quite enjoy doing? Uh, <clears throat> the main reason worldwide is economic. People move around simply because of the economic necessity that, that's perceived in another country. The concept of a better future, not always economically, because sometimes, and another reason certainly is political turmoil, I'm going to leave this country. As functioning as consul uh, here in, in the western states, I, <clears throat> I deal with Chileans, uh, there are about 2,400 of them in Utah, and almost exclusively they all have come to give a better life for their children, and that term is mentioned in, in frequent occasions. <clears throat> But let's focus on the United States just uh, briefly now, and, and I'm not going to give you right now a, a, a too many more charts, but I guess we've got a couple more. The United States, and uh, since this is a larger uh, proportion of those who receive immigrants, let's talk about them. In the year 2003, there were 28 million tourist visas granted to people coming to the United States. 28 million. These are temporary visas. <clears throat> at the discretion, the time discretion of, of the uh, person in immigration, the immigration officer, sometimes generally now just for 90 days. Now people who are come as tourists, of course, are not immigrants to that country. <clears throat> They're really not migrants or uh, immigrants from their own country. But what has happened in, in our country as well as throughout the world is that many people who come in on tourist visas become immigrants. And how? by simply staying as long as they want to stay and not returning. We have no tracking system in the United States to send people back to their country of origin uh, if they don't leave within 90 days. They have to have a round-trip airfare ticket if they come in as tourists, but a round-trip airfare ticket is no guarantee that that person is going to return to his country of origin. That itself is a great contribution to, to people in the United States. Daily there is a flight from Salt Lake that takes deported individuals back to Mexico. Uh, those are people typically who, uh, they may be illegal to begin with, but they may have been people who came in on tourist visas and overstayed their, their visa. <clears throat> Let's see. Student. The second category in which people come in the United States is students. They come in, we've had a little over a million people come in the United States as students to, with visas, I-20s and so on, to study here in the United States. and. Curiously enough, a good many of these people do join another church while they're in the country, and I'll give you a statistic for respecting Asia for that in, in just a little bit. Uh, sometimes students overstay their visas as well and become immigrants in that country, but they're a little easier to track, and, and, and not too many of them do. The this next category of visas is that of immigrant and permanent residents. <clears throat> From the year uh, 2000, from the year 1900, uh, 1998 to 2003, over a period of uh, this uh, six-year period, we were having approximately a hundred, uh, approximately one million people admitted to the United States every year on tour uh, on uh, immigrant and permanent visa status. This is down since two since 9/11, down to about 700,000. It's been much more difficult to get a visa into the United States. 
The United States is the largest recipient of legal immigrants in the world, of any country in the world. And <clears throat> what do you suppose is the largest supplier of legal immigrants to the United States? What's country? Mexico. Mexico, <clears throat> if you will, accounted for 19% of all the, the legal immigrants in the year 2003, uh, about 120,000 legal Mexican immigrants. Mexico is also the supplier of the largest number of illegal immigrants. And the new ICE, or <clears throat> um, Im 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 Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office, it used to be the Immigration and Natural Relations Service. They didn't feel that was probably the right word, and now it's uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. A little bit stronger term, but I don't know that they've been much more successful than, than the previous. <clears throat> and, tries to control this, but they don't. Uh, not, it simply hasn't been possible, and I make the side observation that walls are not the way to solve that problem either. <clears throat> well, uh, I could go on to simply say we are a country of immigrants at the present time. Plenty of immigrants in, in our country. <clears throat> From the decade of 1990 to 1999, the U.S. population grew by 33 million. <clears throat> This is the largest population growth number of any decade in our, our history. Somewhere around 29,000 of that, 29 million of that increase was as a result of uh, immigration to this country. We are still receiving immigrants. At the present time, approximately 12% of the United States is foreign born. Approximately, we don't know that number entirely because of uh, illegal immigrants. The city of New York, <clears throat> 42% in the year 2006 were reported to be foreign-born, 42% foreign-born from a New York Times, and that was up from 28% in 1990. We indeed are a country of immigrants. Uh, about 55% of that 42% are, are Hispanic of, of origin. I have some concerns about this, and I better not take too much time to go deep into them, but. Uh, I have concerns about immig our immigration policies. We, uh, to try to thwart terrorism, some of the world's best minds cannot get visas to work in the United States. Our student visas as well as prof visas for prof professors have been widely, severely limited around the United, uh, in the United States. The people from coming from outside the, the world to study here or to teach here. The number of student visas dropped 26% in 2002 and 11% in 2003, and it continues to fall even now. I don't have any more accurate statistics. Some 35% of all student visas, ap visa applications were rejected outright without even uh, having any more than, than a two or three minute interview. The number of foreigners with advanced degrees or exceptional skills uh, allowed to come into the United States dropped 65% in 2005 to just 15,000 people. The ICE people, the Immigration Consular uh, Services, simply don't have enough workers to screen applicants and so rejection of visas is the easiest source. Well, we are a country of immigrants, but let me talk now about and focus a little bit more on, on uh, LDS. You probably can all trace your ancestry to some other country than the United States. Uh, whether it's since the church was restored or, or, or even before that, we obviously go to another area, but most of us are products of 19th century conversion in Europe. And uh, we, we trace our ancestors there because they really became a lifeblood for the church during the, uh, the second half of the 19th century. Again, in conference, we saw that of the five new general authorities, uh, announced yesterday in the 70s, all of them were uh, from outside the country, and seven of the, four of the five were from Latin America. I got to thinking in preparation of this, do you know the Book of Mormon is really a history of migration? If you look at it that way, you'll think uh, Lehi and, and uh, his son were commanded to go to a new place. They took a long, long trip, eight years in the desert and another uh, year or so crossing, crossing the ocean to a new area. But it doesn't stop there. They established the city of Nephi, and around 200 AD, the Lord says to Mosiah, get out of this town. The Lamanites are going to be persecuting you. Go to another. He goes to a town, goes down, it says, to Zarahemla. And what does he find? Another population of immigrants. The people of, of Mosiah had, had immigrated there and uh, were controlling that area. <clears throat> 
I like that expression, but I'm not going to take time to read it. But we found out that the, the immigrants, that excuse me, the people that were in already established in the city of Zarahemla, <clears throat> welcomed the new immigrants very well. It says they, they established a unity with them. They taught each other their languages. At least we understand that the people from Mosiah taught the language and taught reading and writing to the, the people there. It seemed to work well. Alma is a story of migration. Converted to the church in one place, oppressed, had to take off and go to another place. He to eventually came down to Zarahemla. Down to Zarahemla. The people of Ammon tell us another story of immigration. They had to get out of the land of Nephi and come uh, down to Zarahemla. And then they were probably too numerous to, to be really integrated and said, we'll give you the land of Jershon up here by uh, a new land that's developing bountiful. We read about a Hagoth who uh, builds ships and sails away and it seems to be that they, they never heard from him again. Finally, the people in Zarahemla, the second place where a temple was established, had to move on and establish a temple in the, the third place, the, the inland uh, bountiful in 34 BC. And really, at the end of the Book of Mormon, everybody is refugees. Uh, the, the refugees are trying to get away. They, they've got to get to another land, and they don't make it, and are, are basically wiped out by the, the population that's the dominant population. Now, what does this all mean for LDS, uh, <clears throat> for conversion and LDS conversions? Uh, we'll come up here and, and see what we've I've given you some statistics for, for the United States here, total numbers of conversion, total number of immigrants, and you note the drop here. But we'll go on. I'm going to go back to, oh, oops, dang it, now where did we go here? Um, got to get up here a little ways. Oh, come on. Looks like it wants to go backwards here. That's why I love these things, because they don't work, uh, <laughs> generally don't work for me. There are immigrants all over the world, and we're finding some of them, because many of them seem to be successful to, the, uh, to joining the church when they're in a foreign country. i tell you the story of Eduardo Garnica. I was just with Eduardo during this past week in Mexico. <clears throat> Eduardo lives in Irapuato, Mexico. Well-educated, architect, uh, wife's a school teacher, fine family. His younger brother got a visa to study in the United States in Houston. Went to Houston, there during his first year as a student, joined the church. <clears throat> Told his older brother that he was a member of the Mormon church. His older brother was mad. His older brother is a, a good Catholic from Mexico. Uh, was concerned. <clears throat> he went up to visit him. Eduardo went up to visit his, his younger brother. He was impressed by what he found. He attended church on one Sunday, <clears throat> but he was still traditional Catholic. He went back to Mexico, uh, stayed there, worked there for a couple of years, but was somehow drawn back to Houston. When his brother, younger brother was a senior in the university, he spent a whole, Eduardo spent a whole summer up in Houston studying with the missionary, studying the church, and was baptized without telling his wife, darn it. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> finally, went, at the end of the summer, went back to, uh, to Mexico as a member of the church. He preached the gospel and helped his wife and, and daughter understand the gospel. They are baptized. Since that period of time, Eduardo has served in two different state presidencies and is currently the bishop of one of the main wards in Irapuato, Mexico. And I said, Eduardo, why didn't you join the church here in Mexico? You'd seen missionaries walking around the street in their uniforms, a uh, term that had been, was used there. We don't call them uniforms, but other people do because they all wear dark suits and black ties, dark ties and white shirt. But anyway, uh, Eduardo said, too much family pressure here. I had to get away. I had to join in a place where I didn't feel the strength. And he said, I could really feel the spirit much more in Houston than I could in Irapuato. And I said, is it the same right now? No, no, it's not the same. I can feel the spirit, spirit here now, but I couldn't earlier. It took me to change place to find the church. And in his case, of course, he has stayed very well. There's instructive to note, <clears throat> and a relatively lengthy study that I have here, called More Than Evangelical and Ethnic, the Ecological Factor in Chinese Conversion to Christianity in the United States. There are approximately, every year, about 75,000 Chinese who are given visas to study in the United States. In a fairly intensive study that's been done of Chinese here, we found out that about 
30 percent, well actually say give 33 percent of the Chinese within their first year here join an evangelical church. That is, they join a Christian church. That's important to note. There's, and we ask why, they probably join some of them for fellowship and brotherhood, but for other reasons. Uh, sometimes, be obviously, because they feel the spirit of that church. Uh, <clears throat> so this idea of getting out of your own country and going to another one seems to be an aid to conversion. And of course, in these cases, we have many Chinese who, didn't, who are not religious and may even be anti-religious or anti strongly atheistic before they come but at least a third of them are joining a Christian church when they're here. Curiously enough, as I look at my own area of study of Latin America, I find out that the first members of the church in Argentina were not native Argentines, they were Germans who emigrated to Argentina, talked to their neighbors, and then said to the church, hey, we've got something going. And the first missionaries called to Argentina were German-speaking missionaries. The same is true in, in, in Brazil and other parts of the world. This concept of moving around makes some difference. Now, some more statistics as we come, or if you will, anecdotal statistics. What about in the United States, and what about in OECD countries that we've mentioned that we showed to you previously? Talk to my own son in preparation for this talk who served his mission in, in, in Anaheim, California. He said, what percentage of the people in your mission who were baptized were foreign speaking? I didn't know foreign born because that's not always kept. He said about 50% were Hispanics and about 15% were other languages. So he said only we, we and he was on an English speaking mission, he said we only got to baptize about 35% of the people in the mission. <clears throat> I continued this wonderful type of research and talked to, to the assistant to Noel Reynolds in, in the mission in Florida. Obviously you would expect, what percentage of people you're baptizing are, are of Hispanic background? Between 60 and 70 percent every month was the answer. I called and talked to the assistants in the Provo, Utah mission here. About 30 to 35 percent of the people are baptizing are Hispanics. Those who are called on Spanish-speaking missions to Provo are baptizing two or three times as many as the, as the rest of the missionaries in the mission. And this includes quite a few number of foreign students here at BYU. Talked to uh, Steve Benyon, or got a response from Steve Benyon some time ago in one of the New York City missions. He says over 50% of the people he's baptizing are from abroad. Italy Latin, uh, is baptizing people who come from Latin America to Italy. Friends we have in England tell us the same thing, Spain and Hungary. Between 35 and 40% of people are baptizing. And I really want to see if I can get back to that one statistic. I'm probably impressing the wrong thing here. Can somebody help me, help me make this move? Yeah. Uh, uh, I do want to show you this. Some, some friends in Germany just sent some uh, information. I apologize for that mess. Uh, continuing on. <clears throat> All over the world, I want to get to, to number seven. OK. Good. Me Thank you. you. F5. Oh, just a second. Now, can I change that? I'll try. I, I think I'm changing it here. But I just changed it. You go ahead. Get one more. Got it. Some friends in Germany just sent the statistics from the Hamburg mission from last year. Notice the baptisms, and this is the information I think the church probably has in many places. Uh, of the 118 converts, I believe, that are listed here, 72 were baptized in, in, in were Germans, native Germans. But look at the other countries. Afghanistan, China, Germany, Ghana, <clears throat> Iran, Nigeria, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Romania, and, and even several other countries, the last one were the 11, from several different countries. This is typical throughout Europe. Many people from other countries are simply joining the church. From these wonderful anecdotal statistics that I've compiled, I'm calculating that about 35% of, of the church baptisms in OECD countries is a result of people who are immigrants in that country. That is, the re as a result from migration. Um, I guess I, I would lead, read one more little note. Uh, Cody, uh, my, my research assistant, 
wrote to a, a friend of his in, um, wrote to a friend of his who was serving a mission a, a, in, uh, she's from Hong Kong, but she's serving a mission in Hong Kong and, and Macau, and he says, thanks for mailing me. Last Saturday and Sunday we were so busy to teach eight people from mainland China. We taught them at 11 through 6 after they had the interview. Then they could be baptized on the next day. Maybe I have this here. Let's see if that's the next one. Yeah, <clears throat> you can see the uh, the thing here. But the basic point is that she they, the, they baptized the whole family from China. Some people who were they had to baptize quickly so that the people could leave and get back to China. <clears throat> well, so my theory or idea, working statistic, is that about 35 percent of the people that we baptize in the church are from other areas. <clears throat> And this was one way that we can truly become a more worldwide church, because at the present time we're really not. We're really a, a Western Hemisphere church. Nearly 50% of the Mormons live with, in the United States and Canada, and the rest live, uh, and the majority live in uh, Latin America. We are an 85% Western Hemisphere church. We are not yet a worldwide church in, in any stretch of the means. <clears throat> Why are these people joining? For simple reasons, I think. They find some social identity. There is an upward mobility that may result for them, or at least a perceived upward mobility. But they've broken those family traditional bonds and are now more acceptable to the gospel. The LDS Church, and maybe other churches as well, provide an escape from marginality, alienation, frustration, the helplessness of the new environment. They, there is a perceived economic security for immigrants in, in adopting a new religion. Obviously, there are many other reasons, and just as Eduardo Garnica said, he can feel the spirit there more when he was removed from the, the power of his, uh, his family in another church. We will see more immigration. It is continuing. The, the influx of immigrants to this country and to the OECD countries is amazing. In fact, 28, one of the statistics I have is that 28 countries will see, as a result of immigration, that their population does not decline, but it will remain steady because their birth rate has declined, but immigrants will allow the, the, the growth to, to at least the country to maintain its population. We need the immigrants because they're a dynamic to us. Uh, they, they dynamically infuse us, just as Mosiah infused in Zarahemla the idea of here are records, here is our background. And just as Alma, when he came to, to Zarahemla as well, immigrants may do the same for us. We have problems with retention of immigrants, as you know, and I simply would raise that as something that you will take a look at. To end and conclude, I'd just say, as we were in one of these tiny villages over the, the weekend, over the week, Brad uh, Wilcox and I were viewing our students teaching literacy in these villages, not LDS villages, they're so tiny, they, they, don't, they barely have roads uh, and uh, no running water or electricity. As I was walking through the little path, no streets, a man said to me, hermano. And I turned around and looked, and this was Juan Villafania. I'd met him previously on other trips there. And I said, gracias por llamarme hermano. Thanks for calling me brother. <clears throat> and he said, we are brothers now. I'm a Mormon. And I said, what? And he said, yes, he said, I was working in Arizona. Uh, and the church got, and the missionaries came and found me. I wanted to ask him, did they ask you if you were here legally or illegally, but I didn't ask that, because the missionaries don't ask that either. And he simply said, I'm, I'm a member of the church. But I worry about Juan, because Juan has no chance, if he continues living in Irapuato, to continue on as a member of the church. But he's just one of the, uh, many examples of people who will continue swelling our ranks and who will be spreading the gospel all over the world. We really are a, uh, a church as well as a country of, of immigrants. We really are, if you will, we have it in our blood. So maybe I ought to change the title of this to Migration. It's in our blood. We ought to accept it and use it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lyons. I think we've got time for one or two questions. It's always hard to start with questions, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Yes. 
you mentioned that uh, Bobby Stark's uh, uh, projections have been come under some heavy criticism. What, what, what's the latest? Well, as you know, he projected uh, over that each decade we would grow between around 40 percent at the time in the, the, by the year 2085, as I recall, that we would have, uh, I'm not sure on that, but that we would have 280 million members of the church that time. And what's taken place is we haven't kept growing during the last decade at 40 percent. And so the, the, the projections, you'd have to ask the church as far as what they're projecting specifically because I don't have that total number, but it's going to be much under what Stark, uh, what Stark suggested. But, but it's kind of bold in writing to him. I wasn't sure that he'd respond, but I, I just had my, my research assistant write him a letter, and, and he did respond, but maybe we'll share this information with him. Lee? Um, you had talked about Eduardo was in Aeroquanto as a bishop, but then you said this other man that you just ran into wasn't going to have any yeah, he does because he lives he lives out in the tiny villages and he doesn't come into church. The second she asked about the the, the Eduardo who lived in town in the town of Irapuato, and and I was talking about this other man who lives in a tiny village where there is no church, and uh, uh, he reads he reads scriptures by candlelight if he reads scriptures at all. Uh, but at least he was willing to to identify himself as LDS. But I wonder how he'll he'll maintain. But I thought perhaps maintains in the same way that that our missionaries did in the 19th century. They just traveled through the southern United States, preached the gospel, baptized a few people, and said maintain it, and a few of them did. And then a few of them continued strong, uh, and maybe uh, one Biafania will, will maintain that, but I worry about that. I think, uh, I think we have a harder time even in the United States maintaining these people because many of the people we baptize here are migrant workers who are moving around and, and will not be in a permanent ward or branch could have gone into the problem also of Spanish-speaking branches or, or foreign language branches as opposed to others, but I didn't want to get in that problem. Any further questions? Thank you very much. We'll end it here.